Thanks for the introduction, Andrew, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about some of my research on stellars up in Alaska. So what I would like to do today, I'm going to talk pretty fast, we're on a timeline here. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we generally refer to as the LHX project, or Life History Transmitter Project, based on the technology that we use that I'll talk about. And this is a project investigating vital rates of stellar sea lines in the Gulf of Alaska that's been running for almost 10 years. Uh, but before I get into that, I will start by providing some context, introducing the species that we work with, give you some idea about what's happening with stellar sea lines in Alaska, population trends management issues. I will then present the technology that we're using, and I'll finish up by talking what the title is already suggesting, and that stellar sea lines and something we've found out relatively recently about how they might interact with uh, uh, sleeper sharks and stellar sea lines. So uh, to start with, most of you are probably familiar with stellar sea lions as the largest of the Odoriades. Uh, very large animals with females reaching body mass of uh, up to about 300 kilograms, uh, males much larger, about 1,200 kilograms, and you typically can observe them at the rookeries in summertime from June through August which is when they meet for reproduction. Uh, and probably most of you are familiar uh, with uh, stellar sea lions range around North Pacific Rim, pretty much from as far south as California, past British Columbia, Gulf of Alaska, Aleutian Islands, Bering Sea, and even Japan. And within this range, we now recognize two distinct stocks, the western stock, uh, which is indicated in red here, and the eastern stock, uh, which is indicated in orange. And those are treated differently, at least in the US, under the US uh, Marine Mam Mammal Protection and Endangered Species Acts, with the western portion uh, with the western stock being listed as endangered. Because of a decline down to about 80% of peak levels four decades ago, and that's illustrated in this particular slide here. So over the course of four decades, we've seen a collapse from counts of uh, in excess of 170,000 individuals to as low as uh, near 40,000, but slightly recovering or increasing now. At the same time, the eastern stock steadily increased from a count well below the original western stocks to now being uh, outnumbering basically the Western stock, and they have actually recently been delisted in the United States. So once again, these are the ranges uh, where they can be encountered, and the white box now outlines our study area, which we generally refer to as the Prince William Sound Kenai Fjords region. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a little bit of context, they're not, as you probably know, the only megafauna or upper trophic vertebrate in the basically that has declined in that same time frame. What you're looking at on the right hand side is a decline indicated as percent of maximum abundance over about the same time frame from the 80s through the present roughly of uh, four major uh, vertebrate species in the region, harbor seals, uh, northern fur seals, sea otters, and stellar sea lions all have precipitously declined and the stellar trends right now are kind of divergent within the western stock at least with uh, trends in the Gulf of Alaska, so our study region being more or less stable or even increasing in some areas, while they're continuing to precipitously decline in the western Aleutian Islands with uh, decline rates as high as 15% per year. Um, this is, of course, of great interest in part because Bering Sea Aleutian Island region is home to the largest commercial fishery in the United States, just about any which way you look at it in terms of biomass landings, in terms of dollar value, and that's lar largely the Alaska ground fish fishery. And as a result of the listing of the western stock uh, that resulted from the decline, uh, fisheries restrictions were imposed in the 1990s, in the late 1990s, starting with uh, protective or no fisheries exclusion zones around rookeries and some haul outs. And more recently, actually, starting with a finding in 2010 uh, that was required under in a process initiated by the Endangered Species Act, finding of jeopardy. <laughs> And basically, uh, the fishery service found that Alaska groundfish fishery was likely to jeopardize the continued existence of the western stock of the stellar sea lion in Alaska. And a result, as a result of that finding, the mackerel and Pacific cod fishery in the western Aleutian Islands was closed indefinitely at that time, with, however, more recently in 2014, the restrictions being somewhat eased. So this kind of gives you the context in terms of management issues and population trends that we're investigating. So, speaking of investigations, how did we do that? We basically decided uh, more than 10 years ago 
that what we wanted was to collect information from animals that are typically very difficult to monitor. When working with stellar sea lions, traditionally we would go to rookeries and haulots in the summertime when the animal is accessible to us. We can sample animals, we can outfit animals with telemetry devices, but there's a potentially huge bias in doing that because we may be sampling those that come back, those that do well, those that do not die, those that reproduce. We decided we needed data from the other part of the population that may not reproduce, that may die out at sea. And we wanted multi-year data, and to be able to do that, we developed a, a special telemetry device that we refer to as the LHS tag, which is an acronym for the Life History Transmitter. We developed that in collaboration with Wildlife Computers in Redmond, near Seattle, one of the major telemetry manufacturers. And these tags, of which we just started uh, using the second generation, are interperitoneal implants. So they are, they are devices that are implanted into the gut cavity of young stellar sea lions under gas anesthesia and standard surgical procedures. Um, the image on the left is an x-ray radiograph of one of the fir larger first generation tags in a smaller California sea lion. So you're looking at the tag uh, on the upper part of the radiograph. You can recognize the vertebrae. You can recognize the hip and patella, and basically the hind flippers on the right-hand side. Relatively large by uh, comparison to the body in that particular image. Uh, for older stellar sea lines, they're comparably smaller. And we've started using second-generation tags, which are considerably smaller, and in addition to first-generation tags, have the ability to detect parturition in females, but I will not be talking about that. Instead, let me start by giving you an idea how these tags work. They are satellite-linked transmitters, but they cannot reach a satellite from inside of a live animal because the signal is too attenuated by the tissue. Instead, they monitor the state of the animal, store information in memory, and the idea is that we're looking at post-mortem data recovery. At some point, and this may be years down the road, the animals die. And the idea is that these tags come out of the carcass as the carcass decomposes, is dismembered or digested by a predator. The tags float, they're positively buoyant. They float to the surface of the ocean, recognize that, and begin uplinking to a satellite. And so sometime down the road, and this may again be years later, we get a very sad email that tells us animal 57 just died. But more importantly, it tells us, gives us data about what the animal did throughout its entire life and where, when, and why it might have died. Uh, strictly speaking, what we're looking at is known fate data without any spatial or temporal recovery constraints. And it's high resolution data because we find out exactly when the animal died with a resolution of better than one day. We use two tags per animal uh, for two reasons. A, that increases data recovery probability. But B, and that's much more important, uh, from the ratio of dual to single tag returns, we can actually estimate the data return probability. And that is really important because there may be instances where we don't hear from either tag if they fail to uplink. And we need to accurately quantify that probability. And so why do we use these tags? I already mentioned they tell us why an animal might have died. So basically, these tags, uh, as listed earlier, have a variety of different sensors. The most important ones in this context are temperature sensors, light sensors, and sensors that allow the tag to distinguish what kind of medium surrounds it, and they can distinguish between tissue, salt water, and air. And by looking at this data that is transmitted after an animal dies, data that bridges the mortality event, the time when the animal dies, we can make inferences about why an animal died. And I'll explain very briefly how that works. What you're looking at here in this particular graph on, this, on the right-hand side are three examples of basically simulations in the laboratory using carcasses that we obtain from regional stranding networks of animals of different sizes that die. And what you're looking at is a temperature graph from the moment of death or simulated death in this uh, carcass simulation. Basically, the temperatures from the normal homeotherm body core temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius will gradually decline over a period of a few to several hours as the intact carcass cools, and that is a function of the mass of the animal, the ambient conditions, the type of medium and temperature and flow rates. <coughs> and we developed or parameterized a model that allows us to reasonably accurately estimate body mass at time of death from the temperature curves. So these are the same equations that are 
people use in human forensic pathology to determine time of death when you know mass, when you know the end temperatures, and we solve those for different values and can thereby estimate body mass. The output of such a model is illustrated in the gray shaded areas, and the red dots are the actual cooling curves. So you can see they match fairly closely. Now, the other thing that happens in this kind of an event, which would be a non-traumatic event if the carcass stays intact, the other thing that happens is we don't hear from the tag for some time because the tag stays in the body. It does not sense light, it does not sense air, until it comes out of the carcass, which may be anywhere from weeks to months afterwards. This is what we were expecting to see for the most part. But there are a few instances where you might expect something different. And this is basically shown in this particular graph. This would be classified as a traumatic death as a result of dismemberment or predation. And basically, we would expect to see that the free-floating tags that remain free-floating in the peritoneal cavity come flying out of the carcass as it's dismembered because the predators are thought not to ingest whole sea lines. They're too large for that but instead are dismembered. So the tags are liberated, experience an instantaneous temperature drop essentially, and very quickly sense light and air and begin to transmit. That's what you see on the right hand side with the red dotted uh, curves. Those are from actual predation events. And on the left hand side, two laboratory simulations of tags equilibrated in warm temperature and then transferred to cold water or air respectively. In this particular instance, Again, the tags not only experience the very quick temperature drop, they sense light and air right away and begin to uplink right away. The other thing I want to point out is that we get temperature data ante mortem, basically, before the animal dies. And that also uh, tells us a little bit about the state of the animal prior to its demise. Was it healthy or were there any indications of compromised health? And what you're looking at in this graph uh, are temperature values that were transmitted under controlled conditions at a captive facility, I'll show you some images later, uh, during post-operative monitoring. And uh, on two different y-axes, again, body core temperature, on the lower panel B, you see basically animals that are not compromised in terms of any kind of Im inflammation or immune responses. And the normal body core temperature for these animals is typically 36 to 38 degrees Celsius. In the upper panel, however, you see a few animals that were suffering from some challenges, in part in response to surgery, either inflammation or hypothermia. And so that is something we can look for in the post-mortem data recovery from live animals eventually. Very briefly, how do we go about all this? How do we catch animals? Uh, we catch sea lions in Prince William Sound with a dive team that we send into the water near a rookery in Hollot. You can see a rookery in Hollot in the background, or this is a uh, Hollot at Glacier Island in the background. So we primarily have two divers that go into the water and use a noose to try to noose one of the very interactive juveniles underwater. And in fact, oftentimes the, the uh, divers have a problem finding just one animal or even avoiding animals that have been previously captured because they're very curious and come back and do this over and over again. Once an animal is noosed, the noose is attached to a long rope and a floating buoy at the surface. Lots of safety measures in place. There's a stopper so the noose cannot get too tight. There's a force release and a very quick acting corrosible link. Uh, at the surface, we have a second boat, a specially modified small landing craft that you can see here. Uh, that opens on the side so that we can put a capture box adjacent to the side. There's a tarp uh, that's then deployed right now that's lying inside of the open box. Once we get a noosed animal, we retrieve the buoy line and bring and pull it in, maneuver it next to the boat, maneuver the tarp underneath the sea line, and roll it into the capture box like a big sea line burrito, basically. We then take it back on the main vessel. Uh, we can actually do some initial health assessments and even release an animal right there. But typically, we bring uh, the animals back to a special quarantine facility at the Alaska Sea Life Center. Uh, some people refer to that as seal patrols. We can actually hold up to six animals there at one time under very controlled conditions. It's quarantined again so that we can release these animals after their temporary captivity back into the wild. And we can hold them there for up to six, uh, up to three months, actually, 12 weeks. And in the back there, you see a gray container that's our surgical suite. That's where we conduct implant surgeries. And just a few pictures here under gas anesthesia with several surgeons and anesthetists, highly skilled people. 
And initially, we actually kept the animals there under observation for extended periods of time. Uh, now we release them much more quickly. Okay, back very briefly, that introduced you to the technology that we use and uh, how we catch and implant animals. So what have we done so far? Since 2005, which is when we started doing this stellar sea lions, we have implanted and successfully released 45 young stellar sea lions, weaned animals between the ages of 12 and 24 months. <coughs> And we have accumulated over the years about uh, just over 50,000 monitoring days. We have externally tracked these and controlled animals, a total of 75. We have conducted some carcass testing in various locations uh, where carcasses were deposited on beach, uh, beaches or at sea to see uh, and to contribute to the uh, data return probability assessment. So we have data from, we have actually received return data from those 75 external tags and from multiple implants. The longest ongoing monitoring to date that is successful with a live animal is a nine year old, sorry, uh, an 11 year old female that's been monitored for nine years and it has had two pups by now. Uh, and before I tell you about the actual data uh, that will be of interest in the context of sleeper sharks, a uh, little bit very briefly about control studies. Initially, at the onset of this project, we did a lot of monitoring and assessment under controlled conditions at Seal Contras. We basically monitored, for example, uh, very briefly and quickly a number of physiological parameters. The most indicative one here is the, the black squares, which are haptoglobin concentrations. And you can look at intake pre exam implant in weekly intervals, one week post-implant, uh, reasonably low values, two week post-implants, the haptoglobin concentrations go up, peaking at three weeks and then going back at about six weeks. Haptoglobins are proteins associated with wound healing process, so this is the best indicator actually of when that process is complete. And we pretty much concluded that recovery is more or less complete within six weeks, and from that we established a 45-day post-surgery survival criterion for the purpose of then excluding those animals uh, in the study. All animals to date have, in fact, we were able to confirm for all of them survival past 45 days. Uh, very briefly, we looked at post-release dive behavior, and largely this was normal when comparing implanted animals, the black squares, to non-implanted animals, the open squares. Uh, in November and December, you see slight differences. That is actually not related to implant surgeries, but to captivity. And so the one consistent effect we find in comparing implanted and non-implanted captive animals to free-ranging animals is an effect of temporary captivity with reduced dive durations and dive depths, but quickly recovering within a few weeks after that. And following that, all animals behave like wild animals that never went through temporary captivity. So we conclude by and large that after some initial time, LHX tags and surgery do not affect the dive behavior and ranging behavior of our animals. Uh, we, from early returns and from carcass testing, we concluded that uh, data or event detection probability, data return probability from dual tag <coughs> animals is better than 98%. And so within our sample size, we also conclude that to date we have likely not missed a single event. And then of course the biggest control criterion is survival of these animals. And in comparing the survival as estimated from life history tag data returns and comparing that to a control study uh, by John Maniscalco at the Sea Life Center using branded animals that were visually recited through a remote video observation system, uh, we concluded that survival for the first four years, uh, basically ages one through five, is indistinguishable, indistinguishable between our study group and controls. But the power of this comparison is still relatively small at this point because of our small sample size. So, all right, let's move on to results. What have we seen so far? Since we started, we have detected 17 mortality events. That's about as much as we expected. So right where you would expect juvenile survival rates to lie. Um, their attrition is relatively high. They have a tough life. Um, and the location of those events is illustrated in that figure on the right in Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet, and around Kodiak Island. Of the 17 events, uh, two events did not give us enough data to make any inferences on causes of mortality. The remaining 15 events with data all exhibited precipitous temperature drops and immediate transmission, so were all classified as 
predation events. Just to show you what that particular data looks like, so here are 11 of those 15 events. And in all particular instances of these 11 animals, we saw precipitous temperature drops to ambient sea surface temperatures that are indicated there in the blue, in the form of blue diamonds. So very precipitous temperature drops and the red vertical arrows indicate when those tags began to transmit, which due to the fact how they're, or as a result of how they're programmed, is only once per day at local noon. I do also want to point out uh, the gray shaded area at the top is the normal body core temperature range for healthy animals, 36 to 38 degrees. So no indication of anything amiss with the health of those animals prior to their demise. So these were 11 out of the 15 events. This was another single event and the only one where we did not see precipitous cooling. We saw a gradual cooling and delayed sensing of light and air and onset of transmissions by 16 days. So this particular tag gradually cooled. 16 days later sensed light and air and began to transmit. However, when we looked at the cooling rate, we concluded that this cooling curve under those conditions was most closely matched by a model for a 24 kilogram chunk of tissue when the animal at release had 146 kilogram body mass was actually visually sighted a couple of days before its demise was healthy and probably had a mass closer to 170 kilograms. So unlikely that this animal remained intact and more likely that this also reflects some type of traumatic event. Note also please the surface temperature which is slightly below the final temperature of the cooling curve and that'll show better in a later slide. So that's uh, one additional out of the 15 events. And again, no anti-mortem abnormal temperatures. And finally, the three final events, and those are the ones that I'll talk a little bit about. Those are the ones that we now interpret as possibly reflecting attacks by sleeper sharks. Jumping ahead to the conclusion here. But in these three events, you're looking at very precipitous temperature drops like the other ones. There are two animals on the left and in the center and on the right. The left one, TJ52, we only got data from one tag. We never heard from the other tag. Precipitous temperature drop, and this was an event that happened in August. The precipitous temperature drop went to a temperature that was about half of the sea surface temperature at the time. Again, the blue diamond. Sea surface temperature was about 12 degrees. That temperature dropped to about 6 degrees, and that tag did not transmit until 11 days later. The middle animal, TJ64, we had two tags that did exactly the same thing, the two. And again, we had a precipitous temperature drop, but this time to a temperature above sea surface temperature. And this was an event that happened in wintertime. And then on the right-hand side, you're looking at TJ63, where again, we heard from both tags, and the two tags did slightly different things. One dropped precipitously, that's the solid line, to a temperature above ambient sea surface temperature. And again, this was a wintertime event. And the other tag, the dots, or the circles rather, dropped to about sea surface temperature and then varied. And that particular tag transmitted at the next opportunity, whereas the tag that dropped to a temperature above sea surface did not transmit until six days later. Hmm. And again, no antimortem abnormal temperatures. In a slightly different configuration, basically the same data, 15 events, I think actually only 14 are represented in the image on the right-hand side. What you're looking at is the horizontal bars for each event. The horizontal bars represent the sea surface temperature at time and location of the event. The vertical bars are the difference between the sea surface temperature and the post-mortem temperature. And in all instances, those were very closely matched, except in those four events I just showed you. The gradual cooling one, that's the one on the right, and then the other two that I just showed you. In one instance, the temperature was lower than sea surface. In the other instance, the temperatures were higher. And those temperatures that those tags recorded post-mortem correspond to deeper water temperatures, anywhere between 50 to 100 and maybe 200 meters. And just to give an idea what the temperature patterns in the region typically look like, this is from uh, a data buoy in the Gulf of Alaska, Station 1 it's called, at different depths over the course of the year. 
So months on the bottom, and you typically see surface temperatures, which are the red values or closer to the surface, are warmer than deep water temperatures in summertime, colder than deep water temperatures in wintertime. And this is about what these tags recorded. So the black stars are the post-mortem temperatures that those tags picked up initially, and they matched deep water temperatures for that time of year. So the warmer or colder, respectively, depending on when that happened. The black vertical lines are the temperatures that the tags reported once they had sensed light and air and come out and started transmitting. And so that's when they reported surface temperatures, typically. So we basically conclude from that uh, that most likely what happened was that these tags with the unusual patterns were ingested by a cold-blooded predator. Not killer whales, because they would have remained at about 30, 70 degrees. But likely also none of the other potential cold-blooded predators like white sharks and salmon sharks. Because as you probably know, as lamnid sharks, whites and salmon sharks have the ability to consistently elevate their body core temperature well above ambient by anywhere from 8 to 15 degrees. For example, salmon sharks in Alaskan waters typically have body core temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius. So amongst the suggested predators of stellar sea lines, only Pacific sleeper sharks are really the ones that are truly at ambient deep water temperatures. So we think most likely, and this is an interpretation, we think that most likely the tags in these events were ingested by a Pacific sleeper shark. So very briefly before we get into maybe discussing how sensible that might be or not. One other bit of data, just to sh throw some confusion into the whole picture, is data that relates the location of these predation events, of all 15 predation events, to the habitat utilization assessment of stellar sea lines. So this is, a, we're just at the beginning stages of developing utilization distribution. Uh, a former grad student of mine, Norma Vazquez, uh, actually developed these utilization distributions, and they, she did that from the external tracks of all our study animals, following release implanted and non-implanted animals for different parts of the year. And uh, she basically overlaid the predation locations over that utilization distribution. And here, example, you're looking at six events marked for the January-February utilization distribution. And the distribution is encoded such that the red areas are those areas of higher utilization, higher use, higher sea lion encounter probability. The yellow ones are the ones of low sea lion encounter probability. And you might develop this expectation of maybe uh, having for a specialized predator more predation events in areas of high sea lion encounter probability or space use by the sea lions. And maybe for an opportunist predator, no such spatial focus or pattern. When you summarize all of these, this is what Norma found in her initial analysis that we're now working on refining. And basically, again, what you're looking at is red on the right is areas of high space use. That's where you have a high sea lion encounter probability close to rookeries and haulouts. On the left, you have the low sea lion densities or encounter probabilities. You're basically looking at where those predation events occurred. None of those occurred near sea lion rookeries in high sea lion area use regions. All of them occurred in low, except for two in the middle ranges, and most of them, in fact, outside of the described area. Which, if anything, points away from a specialized predator like killer whales for those events that we don't have any ingestion uh, suggestions, so to speak. So, okay. When we tried to publish this, and we just did after two years of back and forth with reviewers in Fishery Bulletin, when we tried to publish this, uh, we got a lot of pushback from the reviewers who were very skeptical about this idea of sleeper sharks as predators rather than scavengers of larger sea lions. And the largest ones of the one that died was a four-year-old male, probably over 250 kilograms of body mass. So the first question we had to deal with was this scavenging or was this predation? And how does that fit with the picture of, or the perception of sleeper sharks being sluggish, sluggish, benthic scavengers? Let me start by addressing the whole benthic behavior of sleeper sharks. What you're looking at in this particular figure from the 
Hulbert and Mike Sigler and co-authors, published in the Journal of Fish Biology in 2006. You're looking at three representative tracks over time of sleeper sharks in the Gulf of Alaska that were tagged with external pop-up archival tags. And you're basically looking at, over a long period of time, the depth records. And the depth is on the left-hand scale in meters. And you see, for these three different animals, more or less, a lot of vertical movement up and down through the water column, anywhere from depths down to in excess of 400 meters, but in some instances, like the upper graph, the upper portion of the graph, even close to the surface. Sleeper sharks do undergo extensive vertical movement, and at times, for example, go to the surface, hit the surface, and go back down until they hit the bottom, go back to the surface, and never stop. So they are not a benthic organism. They're also probably not a, an exclusive scavenger. There is ample evidence for some sleeper sharks, like for the Atlantic sister species, the Greenland shark, or the southern sleeper shark, that they do attack live seals, for example. There are scars on surviving southern elephant seals, belugas, and Arctic ice seals that demonstrate that sleeper sharks can attack and do attack live pinnipeds and marine mammals. So I would say we need to revisit this whole idea of sleeper sharks as benthic scavengers. Consider their ability to prey on pinnipeds. In our case also, so scavenging versus predation, getting back to that, I don't think that our data suggests scavenging. Because if scavenging were the case, we would have expected to see two things, some indication of abnormal health conditions anti-mortem, and at least the beginning or the onset of gradual cooling, unless the sleeper shark was right there when the sea lion died and then scavenged it. And so I think that is relatively unlikely. So we didn't see abnormal temperatures and we didn't see any onset of gradual cooling. So the other big objection to this whole idea was that uh, Lee Hulbert and Mike Sigler also stomach sampled 200 roughly sleeper sharks that were collected in Prince William Sound near sea lion rookeries in the summertime, and they did not find one bit of sea lion tissue in the stomachs. And that's a fairly large sample. So does that conflict with our finding and our interpretation? I would say not, in part because they collected their samples by long lining which has a known agent size bias, and their mean total length of their sampled animals was 2.2 meters. They sampled near sea lion rookeries and in the summertime. We think that the animals that attacked our stellar sea lions were the large animals, larger than those sampled. Uh, sleeper sharks, amongst other sharks, have been shown to have an ontogenetic or size-related diet shift towards higher trophic levels, as inferred from stable isotope ratios. And in the case of Greenland sharks, it's the larger, older animals that have been demonstrated to prey on ice seals. In fact, from the post-mortem temperatures that we observed in our life history tag data sets, we can estimate using the same cooling rate model reparameterized for a sleeper shark, we can estimate the minimum body mass of a sleeper shark that would result in the observed, essentially constant post-mortem temperatures of the ingested tags for a scenario of a sleeper shark that constantly moves up and down through the water column. And we concluded that our sharks probably had a minimum size of about 2.7 meters. Most of our events happened in wintertime, only three during the summertime that Sigler and Hulbert sampled their sleeper sharks. And all of our events happened away from rookeries and haulouts. So that could explain the difference between their study and ours. But one last point, and then I'll open it up for discussion. This also got me to think about the probability of sampling <coughs> stellar sea lion tissue in sleeper shark stomachs versus our approach of using life history tags. And on a, this was basically a very coarse back of the envelope calculation using the catch rates of Sigler's study for their sample of 200s. We can estimate very coarsely that there are probably around 5,000 sleeper sharks in Prince William Sound and Kenai Fjords region. From our data, extrapolating to our detected number of sleeper shark attacks, we can then assume that there are probably about 87 
or thereabouts sleeper shark attacks in that area per year, which then leads to a likelihood under certain assumptions of sampling stellar sea lion tissue in a sample of 200 sleeper sharks of less than 5%. Basically, a sleeper shark attack on a sea lion from the perspective of a sleeper shark is a very rare event. Probably happens once you look at the level of an individual sleeper shark, once in 50 years. On the side of the sea lions, that is enough to have detectable levels of predation. And in monitoring 36 animals, as we did at the onset of this study, uh, as just published, throughout their entire life, we have essentially have a 99% probability of detecting at least one such event. Why is this important? Well, this is important kind of uh, completing the circle, getting back to uh, the management approaches by the Marine Fisheries Service of reducing fisheries or constraining fisheries and in some regions halting ground fish fisheries. Basically, the uh, net effect of that could be exactly the opposite of what's intended. This is highly hypothetical. But since uh, there are anywhere from three to 10,000 sleeper sharks by caught in Alaskan ground fish fishery per year, Reducing that might ultimately result in what you could call bycatch release of potentially a major predator of stellar sea lions. In a scenario where there is no evidence actually of nutritional uh, stress on sea lions through the impact of fisheries. And with that, hopefully I've given you some things to think about and I would like to open it to questions. I should uh, very briefly mention uh, my longtime collaborator, Joanne Mellish, at the Alaska Sea Life Center, who is my co-conspirator on this. And then, of course, uh, many funding agencies that have supported this work over the years and wildlife computers uh, that has enabled us to do this work. So, questions? So the question was about the, that one female that I mentioned that yeah. uh, we've been tracking for the longest. She was the first animal implanted and released. She had two pups to date that we know of. Okay. Um, and that was with the first generation tags that do not detect parturition. So uh, that was from visual observations by John Maniscalco at Chiswell, the remote video observation system. It is interesting. There is no good data on age at parity in that region. And, um, there is some data by John Maniscalco on reproductive rates. That's been one of the contentious issue. Has the reproductive rate or the pupping rate dropped? Uh, that's been suggested, uh, but not borne out by act what, what little actual data there is. Um, in terms of the likelihood of detecting those and getting reasonable data from the second generation of tags that can pick that up, uh, and hopefully before I retire, um, we'll have to see. We're thinking about that, and we are uh, hoping to develop a, an automated remote uh, message retrieval system that can actually retrieve messages from implanted tags before the animal dies over a short distance when the animals go to the rookeries to reproduce and haul out. Okay. No, none of the tags that you retrieve show participation so far? None of the ones, no. We only started using the second generation tags this year, and we uh, were able to Plant and release nine females this year with the second generation tags. So supposedly the four animals that might have been eaten by the sleeper sharks, are you still getting data from them and will be able to find out what's when they die? What are the tags that work? So the four animals that we got data from from sleeper shark attacks are dead. And that's why we know or why we assume there was a, a sleeper shark attack because uh, the tags 
at some point started transmitting when they were floating at the surface, a few days after the attack. But that's the assumption. The tags, after they start transmitting, typically transmit for about 10 transmission days and then go quiescent. We do not have to recover them. They transmit the data that I showed you and other data. We sometimes try to recover the tags. Uh, quite a few of them have actually been found because they store more information in memory than they can transmit. Do you have any from your other data from the other seals, you have any uh, detection of predation by other animals and how important it is compared to like sleep or shark predation? No, we don't have any data on that. Or I should say, out of we only have data from those 15 predation events, and the four we assume or interpret are sleeper sharks. We can't make any inferences on the other 11 events. They could have been any of the predators. They could have been killer whales, sleeper sharks, white sharks, salmon sharks, something else we don't know about. We can't say. Um, the only thing we can say is that that spatial analysis suggests does suggest that none of them happened in areas of high uh, sea line densities. So none of them would be consistent with a pattern you would expect with a specialized predator like a killer whale. That's about the extent uh, of our speculation. Dave. Um, if you, getting back to killer whales, if you, I'm just trying to interpret the temperature graphs. If you had a killer whale attack and consume the tag, in a portion of flesh, we do not get sort of a stable temperature profile until uh, it were it was defecated and then get a sudden problem. Like how could you differentiate ingestion by a warm blooded predator? So let's say a uh, killer whale yeah. attacked and ingested attacked a sea lion and ingested the tag. What would the tag show? It wouldn't show anything until it was passed or regurgitated, in which case it would look like one of the 11 events. Right. Um, so in that case, we would basically still assume a predation event, but with a wrong time of death, uh, which is possible. I don't think that likely because we have the two tags. And in almost all of those cases, in all cases where we have data from two tags, the two tags matched each other, except that one sleeper shark event. Or I think one was ingested, the other one not. But there is no such event uh, that would suggest ingestion by a killer whale. Uh, where I would think there's a given likelihood that passage or regurgitation would also happen at different times. Right. We are working on that, so we're continuously working on refinements of these tags. We're currently working on an ingestion sensor, a pH <coughs> sensor, basically. Um, the new tags also have motion sensors, and we're hoping to use data from the motion sensors to further illuminate the predator. Um, we can't directly measure depth for a number of different reasons, but are hoping to infer depth of an attack. And the assumption there would be that killer whale attacks are more likely to happen close to the surface, when shark attacks are more likely to happen at depth. Marcus, can you tell us more about the life history of sleeper sharks? So why would somebody call it a sleeper shark? It's such a vicious killer. Uh, <laughs> do they share a similar prey with sea lions? Just help us understand some of this. About to the extent that I can, because I only started looking to sleeper sharks when I when we found this data, basically. So I'm not a shark expert. Uh, they seem to be very opportunistic predator or scavenger. They definitely scavenge. They scavenge on gray whale carcasses, and uh, they prey or eat, they consume, I should say, probably anything just about, apparently, from crustaceans, many species of fish, including, however, fast-swimming, scombrid, gadded, salmonid fish. Um, and for example, in terms of larger prey, smaller prey is apparently ingested whole and sucked in. They're a suction feeder for the most part. And their feeding apparatus is structured such that it doesn't seem like a white shark, salmon shark, or killer whale even capable of completely dismembering a large prey item like a sea lion. But the large uh, sleeper sharks apparently do like a giant cookie cutter type uh, removal of prey mass from larger prey. And on, sea, on gray whale carcasses, for example, they've shown photos of cookie cutter chunks missing out of gray whales, and oh, the cookie is about this size. So if you imagine that coming out of the belly of a sea lion, you can imagine the sea lion 
the post and the tags being ingested. In, um, like I said, the note, the, the classic notion based on absence of data was largely very sluggish, bent thick scavenging. I don't think that's really correct. Uh, they do move, but they move very slowly. Uh, we don't know whether they have the ability uh, to exhibit burst speeds. Um, some speed measurements have been made, but for very short periods of time. So I think personally, it's my interpretation of what little data there is, that needs to be revisited. Any final question? Oh, boy. Um, there's, I couldn't really tell where the, the uh, locations were, but I know there's some subsistence harvest of, uh, of seals anyway in, in southeast Alaska. So is there any chance these could be subsistence harvests? And what would that look like for your tag? Or would, would you necessarily expect the people to return the tag or even encounter it if they were doing whatever they did for subsistence? So um, that's a very good question. I don't think that any of these were subsistence harvests uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, they all occurred at sea, apparently. Uh, and that, so for example, if an animal were shot and this happened at sea and it was not recovered right away, we would see, we would expect to see the onset of gradual cooling. Uh, unless, again, the sleeper shark was right there where the animal was shot and scavenged <laughs> the carcass, something we cannot exclude. Well, that's bad luck. Yeah, that would be bad luck. <laughs> but having lots of the bad luck and having that be the only cause of mortality, I would think is unlikely. Uh, if it happened ashore, we would still expect to see the onset of gradual cooling until the Dead Sea line was uh, cleaned and the tags came out and would sense light or air. So unless that happened within uh, no more than about 30 minutes, then I think that would be very unlikely. So I think it's unlikely. But there are a lot of things we cannot categorically exclude. But again, I think it's a matter of likelihood. So of course we have to stop the questions because we have an undergrad class coming in. Um, I do want to mention one announcement is that tomorrow we are running our 22nd year of the BC Mental Symposium. Then we'd like to see what this theater looks like when it's standing room only. Uh, we don't want to pop in tomorrow. Uh, we've got 50 talks being given tomorrow, five minutes each, for those that are speaking. And uh, not that we're even our lab at all. Um, but if you would like to see more of Marcus will be speaking, he's got one of his grad students up here with him as well. And uh, I want to thank you, Marcus, for very stimulating and both of your talk. Thank you. Thank you.